Um, welcome everyone to today's program, Recovery Connections panel discussion. We have a really, really great program for you, a couple of really, really great uh, uh, speakers. And um, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. So my name is Mitch Woolley. I'm president of HSMA in Los Angeles. I'm so happy to be here and I'm even more happy that all of you have decided to join us today. Get some really, really good knowledge. Uh, we're getting really, really close to opening back up and everybody's just super excited. Um, I know I am, and I'm sure ready to get back to uh, meeting, meeting in person. I want to introduce really quickly our Los Angeles chapter board of directors. Um, our immediate past president is uh, Samantha Rodriguez. Our illustrious uh, VP of Programs and Education is Libby Zarahi, who's on a call today. Um, Jen Pachedli is VP of Membership. David Barnett is VP of Finance. Craig uh, Carbonaire is VP of Social Media, and he's also a new dad. So he's, uh, I think he's got daddy duty um, today and uh, wasn't able to join us. LaVon Miner, uh, who's VP of Sponsorships, and Jody Flowers is VP of Student Affairs and COVID Recovery. And finally, last but not least, Sandra Martinez, who is our Managing Director, and Sandra is just looking so fabulous in that headshot there. Glad you guys, glad you guys are here today. I want to introduce our um, MC slash moderator for today, Libby Zarahi, who is Sales and Marketing Task Force Director at Holiday Inn. And Libby is going to kind of take us through this and introduce our speakers. Libby, would you like to take it away? Well, thank you. Can you advance, please? Just a house, couple housekeeping reminders for everybody. Make sure your audio is muted unless you're speaking because it diminishes the background noise. And by doing so, everyone has a better hearing reception. Um, if you have questions, put them in the chat box and we'll try and we won't try, we will go through them at the end of the presentation. It just makes a more organized uh, format so as not to interrupt the speakers. Thank you. Our local chapter, we continue to move ahead with insightful meetings and collaborations. The June meeting is rather exciting and it's still in development and that is our networking job fair. Who's hiring? What you need to do to position yourself as a preferred candidate for the career you aspire to. And I'm sure many of you know the number one challenge for owners, hotels, general managers is supplementing their labor force. So this is an effort to help employers and also obviously help our membership in gaining jobs if they're not currently employed. Thank you. One other reminder is HSMAI globally offers all the local chapters many, many resources. Um, the Global Coronavirus Recovery Resources, there is a segment on the website for that. But also when it comes to certification and career development, we have um, the HSMAI University Online Education with three or four certifications. And I know there's several in our group right now, me included, that are pushing through that digital uh, certification and it is no light task at all but it's so relevant to today's living that um, it's going to make you a more suitable candidate and more um, just give you the right tools to do your job and be competitive in the, in the industry that we compete with now this is really the exciting part is talking about today's presentation and just to let you know i got a little bit of a preview of the presentation and I promise you, you will not have a more relevant piece of information or pieces of information than what you're going to get out of today's meeting. So to give relevance to today, today's meeting and our speakers, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about them, even though portions of their biography were placed on um, the registration. First, let me introduce Heather Rosman. She's the Executive Director for the Hotel Association of Los Angeles representing our interests, the interests of the hotel and lodging industry in greater Los Angeles. She has over two decades of experience in association management, government, community relations, political campaigns, and business development, all relevant to what's going on in our market right now. Prior to joining the Hotel Association, Heather managed community programs for several major infrastructures that total approximately $4 billion. So she is not immune to big projects or anything intimidating. Um, she recently served as commissioner on the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission 
appointed by our honored mayor, um, Eric Garcetti. And Heather, I thank you so much for the collaboration. It, it was outstanding and I know our membership will, will conclude with that today too. Next, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Adam Burke. He is certainly not new to all of us, but I always find out something new about Adam and I'd like to share that with you. We know that he serves as the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Bureau, overseeing the global brand marketing and all the sales strategies for one of the world's most diverse organizations and destinations. He first joined the organization as chief operating officer in 2016. He has quite a bit of um, history behind him with uh, Discover LA. Adam is responsible for achieving the organization's mission. This is, this is so compelling to improve the quality of life for all Angelinos through the economic benefits of tourism. That to me is so compelling, not bring more people into the city, not get more people just to come to Los Angeles, but quote, to improve the quality of our lives. That is a very overarching statement of what we're going to learn today. With more than 25 years of experience in travel and tourism, Adam previously served as the Senior Vice President of the Customer Loyalty Program for Hilton, a well-known brand, and other op operating positions within that um, uh, well-respected brand. His current affiliations, and there's a reason why I'm sharing this with you, <clears throat> in addition to his current job. He is a member of the US Travel Association Board of Directors, Global Leadership and Equity, diversity and inclusion, how timely is that to already be a part of that community? He is in the Meetings Mean Business Coalition, the Board of Directors for the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, the Sister Cities of Los Angeles, and Central City Association of Los Angeles, as well as advisory boards for the Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment Commission and Simple View. So when you roll all those up together, there is quite a compass that we're being presented with today. And for those of you that are interested in getting a copy of today's presentation deck, we will certainly make that available to you. If you can um, email that to Sandra with your request, we'll make sure you get it. With that being said, I'd like to sincerely thank Heather and Adam, your extraordinary leaders and take it away. Well, oh thank my you. goodness, Libby. With the build up like that now, with no, no pressure at all, really. <laughs> right, yes. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, really happy to have a great partnership between Adam and I. We're very much uh, the yin and yang of, of our associations and our businesses together. So um, hopefully it'll be a good dynamic presentation. But um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we do, why our work matters, uh, impacts to business during COVID, navigating reopening, and then how are we gonna get our back on our feet once things are, are ready to go? So um, a little intro about HALA, uh, the Hotel Association of Los Angeles. We're a nonprofit member organization representing the hotel and lodging industry in LA County. And our primary focus is really government relations, advocacy, and working with local electeds to make sure that hotels have a voice uh, when new laws are being developed and enacted. So. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So really just want to make sure that uh, we stay involved um, and, and really provide a resource to our local electeds and, and decision makers as they, um, you know, really learn that our industry is rather complex. Um, and like any other association, we do uh, member resources information. Um, but overall, I'd, I'd say that my job is to make your job easier. Um, I want to make sure that regulation of our industry is fair and balanced so that we can focus on hospitality and creating memorable experiences for our guests and clients. Um, so why is our industry so important? What makes uh, tourism and hospitality so um, special? Why should, why should politicians and legislators find our industry so important? Um, simply put, uh, tourism is, is one of the primary economic drivers for the greater LA region. Um, we're an iconic destination that drives uh, huge economic numbers, taxes and jobs, uh, transient occupancy tax from hotels, and that I don't think a lot of people in the general public realize that that transient, transient occupancy tax 
goes to uh, general services. And so that pays for police and fire and services like tree trimming and potholes. So we really are the fabric of what makes um, this city run. So, uh, you know, tourism is also a huge jobs creator. Um, during the pandemic, we really felt that loss. Um, we had about uh, 168,000 jobs lost in the city of Los Angeles alone, according to the mayor's office. So um, it's a really huge uh, impact that's felt um, throughout the, the community from a jobs perspective. And, um, you know, when we talk about recovery, your roles in sales and marketing is, is absolutely critical to getting our industry and our economy back on its feet. So um, I would want to thank you all for the work that you do and, and the, the push that you're about to, to go through with us in reopening. So what did we do when we were shut down during COVID? Um, I can honestly say that I am very, very proud of the people in our industry, and you should be too. Um, we really stepped up during the pandemic. We provided over a million meals to seniors. Uh, we distributed free PPE. We provided supplies for uh, persons experiencing homelessness. And we worked really closely with the state, county, and local cities to support Project Room Key. Um, all of the hotels that participated were initially notified through the Hotel Association, and we had about 30,000 rooms uh, volunteered to uh, participate in the program. So now we're even taking up the vaccine distribution support. So um, I just really wanted to highlight that for everybody to show that it's, it's really in our nature. Um, it's a part of our business. We are hospitality. We take care of people in good times and in bad. So next slide, how are we going to rebuild and get back to those good times? Um, currently, I'd say we're in a bit of a transitional phase and I'm, getting, I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit on this next part here. Um, so we're still operating under the state of California's tiered system for reopening. Uh, that is until June 15th. Uh, <laughs> June 15th, when the state of California is uh, back to business as usual, and I know we're all eager to know what that really means and feels like, um, but for now, we're in the yellow tier. And so the state defines that as minimal risk with most indoor business operations um, are open, but with modifications. So let's, let's pause for a minute before we talk about the yellow tier, because I think it's important for everyone to remember sort of the hierarchy of government as we move through reopening. So let's take the mask mandate, for example. Uh, the federal government lifts the mask mandate. However, it's still a state of California requirement. So the state then lifts their mandate, but what about LA County and LA City that each have their own mandates? So as we've experienced throughout COVID, if these various juris jurisdictions are not aligned at the same time, we have a patchwork of laws that we have to navigate through opening, reopening. Uh, which makes our jobs even more uh, difficult to navigate as these things are constantly changing. So, you know, every county is kind of left to uh, create their own protocols. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, Patty McJanet and I and a group of hoteliers worked very closely throughout the pandemic, um, really from the, the get-go to assist the Department of Public Health in developing some of their uh, health officer order protocols. Um, so, you know, we were able to show them from the outset that we do cleaning uh, and, and safety really almost better than any other industry. We depend on these clean and safe environments for our guests and for our employees. And this was a business standard way before COVID-19 was ever even a thing. Um, so some of the protocols that are in place today um, are, are still important for us to be aware of. Um, just briefly, and I'm sure you've all seen it, for hotels, it's Appendix P as in pumpkin. And I'll put all of these links into the chat as soon as I'm, I'm catching my breath here after the, the presentation here, but um, P as in pumpkin, Appendix P. Uh, and then for large events and gatherings, it's Appendix B, B as in Bravo. Um, and we are really pushing for clear direction on these protocols, trying to get the, the county to have um, some really linear information that is easy to decipher and implement. Um, I know it's, it's been really challenging, but um, uh, you know, I think we're on the right track. I think all three state 
county and local governments are, are starting to feel that alignment. Um, you know, even today, um, I'm hearing some rumors that the state guidance for 5,000 attendees and up is likely to be finalized any day now. So this information is coming out fast and hard, um, but you know, I really want everybody to um, keep a keep a sense of some of these um, hierarchies of government as you're as you're implementing the protocols. Um, what I really wanted to call everybody's attention to back one slide, if you could. Um, really wanted to, to call everybody's attention to this um, county regulation. It's, it's a proposed event form included in Appendix BB, and the event form is required to be completed and submitted to the Department of Public Health at least five days in advance of the event. Um, this, this form should be completed by the event organizer. So for instance, if the American Dental Association is having a large meeting, that event organizer who contracted with the venue is responsible for completing that form and submitting to DPH. Um, in the event that there is no official event organizer, um, that it would fall upon the venue, like a hotel or a restaurant organizing the event to complete and submit the proposed event form. Um, ultimately, it's the responsibility of all parties to make sure the protocols are being adhered to. Um, but this proposed event form, I want to be clear, is not an approval. You don't have to wait for DPH to review and approve. Um, this, this form, however, can be used uh, by the Department of Public Health to uh, send inspectors to an event and can also be used for contact tracing in the event of an outbreak. So um, I don't mean to be a rain cloud here in this conversation, but I think some of these, these little final points of, of um, you know, not, not reopening, but I'll say still the restricted parts of how we do business, it's important to know that that's there and that's a part of our, our regulation. But the hotel associations working really closely with DPH and with um, LA Tourism to, um, to get us to a path of, of clear and free opening soon. So um, I know it's a lot, of, a lot of information and it's tough to make sense, but you know, really the overall message here is that we can all confidently say to both lawmakers and to future event and group booking clients that our industry is clean and safe. Uh, we wrote the book on this stuff. Um, our industry's had an excellent track record, phenomenal throughout the pandemic of, of staying safe. Um, and so the next slide shows some of the clean and safe programs that um, all of the, the various entities have um, implemented and developed throughout COVID, starting with the state, national programs, California hotel lodging, and then all of the brands. So we are absolutely saturated and covered with these great programs, um, but these are all industry initiated programs. So um, the, the links and the information here that I'm um, sharing with you, I'll put it in the chat again, um, and it's all available on the Hotel Association website. Um, but I think we can kind of get into the fun stuff now and Adam and I are going to tag team this next little part um, and, and sort of announce a new program um, that's around, it's, it's called Share Care Verified and it's with Travel uh, Forbes Travel Guide. And while we all have our own programs, um, I think it's important for the consumers to feel very comfortable and excited um, that we have sort of a third party well known brand like Forbes um, backing these programs. So um, it's, it's, you know, a way to sort of standardize all of these programs across all of the platforms um, so that they're aggregated in one place and everybody feels very comfortable with, with the protocols in place. Um, Adam, do you want to jump in on sort of the, the next part of this here on the certification? Yeah. I'd be happy to. And, you know, I would say right at the outset, um, I can't thank Heather enough for the partnership with HALA and also our local hotel community, um, certainly Javier Cano and the Tourism Marketing District. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a little bit here. And also Joan Liu and the team at the city's tourism department. I mean, I think if the last year has proven anything, it's the way we're managing through this is as a community and just the spirit of collaboration has been incredible. So what Heather said is, is exactly right. Um, so now we get to think about this more from a marketing and promotional perspective, which is while we've certainly been stressing that every hotel in LA County is complying with the county health officer's order, 
the way it's actually implemented in different brands and different property types, we found from research consumers are a little bit confused because even though they know that the protocols are in place, it may vary significantly from property to property as to how they execute against that. So what Forbes and ShareCare really developed is a platform where they don't have their own protocols. Each property simply uploads their existing safety protocols and ShareCare has about 300 touch points where they go ahead and they validate that the hotel's protocols are compliant with the governing county protocols. The other thing hotels have to do is they have to regularly attest that they're both monitoring and remaining compliant with that. But really what it lets participating hotels do is when they go through that process, they earn the shared care verified badge. And they can use that in all of their communications with customers, including on both the leisure and the group side. So one of the things we've really been trying to do is look for competitive advantages for LA. We wanna do things first. And in some instances, we wanna do things exclusively. So we negotiated with ShareCare that we started small because there are about 186 hotels in the LA Tourism Marketing District. And by starting with the TMD, we were able to negotiate exclusivity with ShareCare and Forbes. So LA became the first city in the United States to offer the opportunity for all of their hotels to participate in the ShareCare Verified Program. In addition to that, we're certainly going to be working with Heather's team to broaden that so hotels all across LA County and smaller hotels in the city can also take advantage of this. But we also negotiated exclusivity. So no other destination can match that competitive claim until July 1 at earliest. So these are the kind of things we're doing, not just to inspire consumer confidence, because I think we'd all agree, right? That the biggest thing we've got to do is get travelers comfortable that they can get back on the road and have an experience that's not just safe, but honestly also enjoyable. So it's partnerships like this, um, you know, Forbes Travel Guide has put a lot of promotional weight behind this. Internova Group has put a lot of promotional support behind it. So it's things like this that I think are really helping us from a marketing perspective. So with that, um, Heather, is there anything else you wanted to say before we transition into the more of the marketing and sales recovery? No, I just love to really thank you for all the work that you're doing to help fill up our hotels and bring people back to work. Um, we couldn't do it without you. So really, thank you. No, but it, it is my pleasure. As, as you heard from Libby, you know, um, I come out of the hotel side of the business. I spent 17 years with Hilton, but I've also worked with Hyatt and Four Seasons and Club Med, including, you know, on property roles. So, you know, I think for all of us, once you get the whole industry in your blood, it never leaves. I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to meet with you all today because I think we now have some very good reason to be optimistic about what the rest of the year is going to look like. Uh, I would describe myself as a pragmatic optimist. What that means is I always think the glass is half full, but I also think we have a lot of work to do to fill the other half. So I think it's a, a collaborative effort. The other thing I'll say is much like HALA, a lot of people don't know that LA Tourism is actually also a nonprofit organization. And we represent over 1,100 members and their businesses across the broad spectrum of our local travel and tourism community. And of that 1,100 member base, about 40% are hotels. So it's a significant sector of our overall membership base. Um, the other thing I'd say is, and, and I think this is something we all need to lock on, arms on moving forward. I think we need to do everything we can to put a human face on our industry. Because I think one of the things that we found during the last year was when you talk about hotels, a lot of people think these are basically big corporations. Well, what they don't realize and what all of you already know is we have 1,200 hotels in LA County and two thirds of them have fewer than 300 rooms. So, you know, it's not what people think it is. And I think the other thing is people don't understand how heavily franchised all the major brands are. So the reality is I think we really need to impress upon them that not only as Heather had shared, were we the fourth largest employer pre-pandemic with almost 550,000 Angelinos working in the industry, but it is a lot of independent small business owners who represent our local hotel community. And I think that's something we can all really lean into. So um, I don't know if, I'm sure all of you may relate a little bit to this image. Um, I, I, you know, while 
we can talk a lot about the last 12 months being unprecedented. I think what should give us all comfort is there actually is precedent for this. It's just order of magnitude, right? Time after time, our industry has been incredibly resilient, whether it be after the tragic events of 9-11, whether it be the Great Recession, H1N1, travel and tourism really can help lead the way back for economic recovery nationally, and particularly here in LA. So kind of let's jump into the good news. One of the things that's really important to understand is that even during the downturn, you all know that hotels ostensibly were never closed. You know, we had some hotels that had to suspend operations for a time, but the vast majority of our properties were either hosting first responders, relief workers, and actually were open for leisure business for a significant amount of time. So one of our goals as the official destination marketing and sales organization for the city of LA was to keep promoting the destination with the right message at the right time and to the right audience. The reason I say right time, there were times early in the pandemic and particularly during the surge, people were not in the right state of mind to travel. And it makes no sense to spend money trying to promote to that audience when they're not ready to get on the road. But because fortunately we had the resources to continue marketing the destination, we believed that we would actually pick up market share even during the downturn. And the great news is that's exactly what came to pass. So if you look at these side by side, 2019 and for years before, this was really kind of the pecking order. New York, Oahu, and San Francisco were always slugging it out for the top three spots. And LA was always just tantalizingly close to breaking into that number three spot. The reason you see adjusted occupancy, by the way, is I think we can't overstate the importance of how quickly our hotel supply has recovered in LA County. So in a lot of these other destinations, they still have a significant amount of their inventory that's not come back. So obviously the fewer rooms you have to sell, the easier it is to have a higher occupancy. So what you see for adjusted occupancy is we are assuming that all of these markets have 100% of their inventory back. And by the way, in LA County, as of last month, our inventory is actually up 1.2% over 2019. We now have more rooms than we had pre-pandemic because hotels have continued to open. If you fast forward to 2020, we actually leapfrogged into third place. And I think there are a couple interesting thing here, things here. Number one, Tampa, St. Pete, and Phoenix were never in the top 10. Well, that's not surprising. Number one, Florida and Arizona were among the most aggressive to reopen. And, you know, they had some struggles with that. I mean, they reopened so aggressively that they had some problems with spikes and they had to open, close, open, close. But at the end of the day, they were very outdoor markets where people were looking for more of an outdoor experience. And let's not forget, you know, Tampa got a pretty big bump from the Super Bowl. But the thing to note is they have about half of our room supply. So if you're Tampa St. Pete, you're looking at 48,000 rooms. If you're Phoenix, you've got 60,000 rooms. Well, in LA with 106,000 rooms to sell, we were almost at parity on adjusted occupancy. And you know, by the way, I don't take any joy in this because we are all colleagues and we hate to see anyone in our industry struggling. But New York, San Francisco, and Oahu fell all the way to eighth, ninth, and 10th place. And you know, let's face it, this is gonna be a fight for market share. So this is really encouraging news. Uh, by the way, I'm not suggesting any of us should be doing cartwheels over 45% occupancy, but it's all relative and we did better than our competitive set. Beyond that, look at just the last four months. So in January, you know, right as the surge was finally need, starting to ebb. Talk about the nature of the program schedules. Oh, I'm sorry. We've got, looks like we've got some crosstalk. Um, so in January, we were at about 43% occupancy. By the time we hit last month, we had jumped a full 20 points, up to 63% occupancy. That's a remarkable increase in just 120 days. And beyond that, we have seen that sustained now for about six weeks. And a lot of the hotels are actually at 78 to 80% occupancy on the weekend. So there is tremendous pent up demand. Now, the other thing is, you've probably heard this before, but tourism economics has said, look, for the hotel community, it is going to take us until 2024 to see full recovery. And that means in terms of visitation and visitor spend and certainly ADR, ref par, and occupancy. But I think something that's really important to note here, if you look at 2021, at 38 million visitors, that's actually 75% of the demand 
we had in 2019. And if you look at next year with 40, 44 million visitors, that's 87% of the demand we had in 2019. So what's really driving the pace of this recovery, it's gonna be the mix of the business and ADR. But I think it's really encouraging that we are seeing demand rebound much more quickly than a lot of people were expecting. And I think it's because there's so much demand for Los Angeles. I mean, obviously, historically, we've gone after the international markets really heavily. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But because that business is not back right now, those are our most lucrative customers. So we've really had to invert the funnel. We started with locals taking staycations. From there, we moved on to our drive markets. And now we're back in market talking to short and long haul flight markets based on consumer sentiment. So it will take longer for RevPAR to recover. But at least we know that by next year, we're going to have about 87% of the demand back. And part of the reason for that is going back to what Heather talked about. So if you look at the yellow tier, um, I cannot say enough about the work that Patty McJanet and Heather Roseman and Javier Cano did with the county's economic resiliency task force. Because as you probably know, and as you saw from Heather's presentation, once the state issues its guidelines, it is up to each county health officer whether they want to align with those guidelines or be more restrictive. They cannot be less restrictive. But LA County has taken a more conservative tack. And you know, honestly, it's been a great partnership with Dr. Ferrer and her team because they really have allowed protocols to be developed with industry expertise. So it truly has been a partnership so we can create both a safe experience, but a positive one for our guests. I can tell you that because of their efforts and so many of the hotels who were actively involved in this process, that when we moved to the orange tier and to the yellow tier, the county fully aligned with the state. And I think that's a direct result of Heather and Javier and Patty and their efforts. So in good times, one of the reasons LA has been one of the top performing markets, there's nothing you want to do that you can't do in LA. What you see here are really our six, what we call product pillars. These are the things that we use to promote the destination most heavily in terms of our product and guest experience. Well, now in the yellow tier, there are no sectors that are closed for business. Some of them certainly are still operating at reduced capacity, but I can also tell you personally, I've taken no fewer than four staycations over the last eight months, and I've been to two Kings games at Staples Center. It's not the same experience, but it's still an incredibly positive one. And now that we have our demand drivers back, that's what's gonna fill the hotels. But I think probably most important is meetings. You all know that because California was taking a more cautious stance, California was the last state in the nation to reopen for professional meetings and events. The great news is meetings are back and honestly at a larger volume than we thought we were gonna get at first. So in the yellow tier, we can now have events today of up to 400 participants, as long as every participant can show proof of either vaccination or a negative COVID test. And I think the or there is really important. It's not in both and, it's either or. So we have a lot of larger self-contained events that we can welcome back today. And if you can't have 100% proof of vaccination or negative test, we can have up to 200 and we can have up to 200 participants indoors as well. Now that does require that everyone is fully vaccinated. And by the way, this is a really important logistical point. Full vaccination from the county's perspective does mean two full weeks from the date of your second shot, unless it's the J&J &J vaccine, which is one shot, or if it's a COVID test, it has to be within 72 hours of the start time of your event. I ran into this when I went to a King's King at Staples. It was before we'd been fully vaccinated and thankfully we all are in our family now, but I had to make sure that I got that test. So when I got to Staples, it was within 72 hours of the start time of the game. But you know, those are all things that we can operationally handle. And what it means is with us still having a commitment to the appropriate safety measures, you know that Barbara Ferrer's team announced that it won't be until next month that they look at eliminating face coverings. By being vigilant, we're actually able to open up a significant portion of our group sector. And I think the thing that's really important to note, um, this really surprised Heather and me, for example. Believe it or not, no one had ever really done a comprehensive economic analysis of the impact of meetings and conventions in LA. You know, we've done a lot of work with tourism economics, and I'll tell you, 
you know, Wendy Keel has been a leader in this for years, uh, both with LA Tourism, but before that with Universal Studios Hollywood. Now what she's doing with tourism economics, um, so many of the best practices in our industry really have come from Wendy. And we've really worked closely with Adam Sachs and the team at Tourism Economics to look broadly at the impact of tourism. But last year, we actually, at the end of the year, commissioned Oxford Economics to look specifically at the economic impact of meetings and conventions in LA. And I'll tell you, the numbers are staggering. So in 2019, we had almost seven and a half million participants that directly supported almost 150,000 jobs and it's a $24 billion industry for LA. Beyond that, it's almost a billion dollars in state and local tax revenues. I think these are numbers that are incredibly important for us all to have ready in our elevator pitch because the thing we found is a lot of our local officials and agencies didn't necessarily understand just how critical the group segment is to our economy and to our recovery. So we're really pleased to have this kind of information available now. The other thing is, it's the name of the game has all been about rebooking, right? We wanted to make absolutely sure, and I want to give a lot of credit to Darren Green, who's our head of sales and services globally. Kathy McAdams is our head of citywide sales. A lot of you probably know her. She's been in the industry forever, along with Brian Churchill, who heads up hotel sales. Their goal has been a couple of things. Number one, we wanted to retain every piece of citywide business we could. And honestly, that, that was a challenge because LA was closed for business and California was closed for conventions when a lot of other markets were open. And to continue focusing on booking new business for the long term. So just some highlights here. The first thing is Darren and his team pivoted very quickly and this was a competitive advantage for LA. So we always like to try and push the envelope and even before people were doing a lot of virtual, in 2015, LA was the first market in the country that had a comprehensive 360 degree tour of our convention center virtually. And in the intervening years, Darren and his team built out a whole catalog of virtual content so that for those planners who couldn't make it here for a site, we could still show them all of our major venues, including the hotel community. Well, the good news is when COVID hit, while a lot of other destinations were scrambling to try and create virtual content, we already had it. So they've done extensive virtual site inspections and sales calls, and that has really put us in a position to rebound fairly quickly. Beyond that, you know, you can't sugarcoat it. We did have 15 cancellations on the citywide side because they simply couldn't come to LA. But again, we talk a lot about partnership, working with HALA, working with the Tourism Marketing District, the Convention Center, host hotels, venues. We collaborated to try and offer as much flexibility to these citywides as possible. And as a result, we've actually been able to successfully rebook 11 of those citywides for future years. That's almost a three in four retention rate. And I can tell you from our conversations with our peers across the country, that's a pretty enviable retention rate. A lot of other markets have not had that success. A great example, by the way, outside of this is, you may remember, we were supposed to have Major League Baseball's All-Star Game last year. It's been rebooked for 22. So next year, we're going to have the All-Star Game. And beyond that, we expect to secure another 21 LOIs by June 30th, which is the end of our fiscal year. And of that, about half represent new business. So it's really been a focus on both retention, but never taking our eye off the ball in terms of new business. I talked earlier about international. So, you know, when we look at the international marketplace, these guests are by far our most lucrative. They stay the longest, they spend the most. If you wanna look at it on average, it takes two and a half long haul domestic travelers to equal the spend of just one international visitor. And we know it's gonna take a little while for this to come back. Um, I will say I can take absolutely no credit for what's on this slide, but Patty McJanet absolutely can because she was part of what she was with the organization. She was one of the architects of this strategy. LA is the only destination. You say that again. LA is the only destination in the US that has our own full time offices and full time team members in the international marketplace. Every other competitive destination they use marketing and PR firms. And there's nothing wrong with that. We do that in some of our secondary markets. But over 22 years ago, Patty and the team in LA Tourism said, if we are going to really win in the international marketplace, 
We have to hire people from the local market who have expertise in tourism, and we want them to do nothing but sell and market LA every day. So these are our own employees. And while sadly, like all of you, we had to make some tough decisions about staff reductions, we did hold on to every one of our international licenses and offices. So we are in seven international markets. We've been in London for 22 years. We've been in China for over a decade with four offices. We've been in Sydney comparably. And we actually last year became the first destination to open a full-time office in India. And if you look at the numbers, you know, we got to play the long game here. A decade from now, India is very likely to eclipse China in terms of visitation. This is going to give us first mover advantage when international visitation comes back. You also should all know this is a key priority for Commerce Secretary Raimondo and for the National Travel and Tourism Office working with U.S. Travel. They recognize that international travel is one of our largest service exports. It generally generates about a $69 billion trade surplus for the US. So the very practical things they're talking about right now are, number one, we know that 80% of international visitors will not come to a destination if they have to quarantine. But we also know that 88%, so almost nine in 10, are more than happy to take a COVID test. And with the increased vaccination rates, what we're collectively advocating for is we should be able to open up our borders responsibly without quarantine requirement as long as people are willing to show proof of either a negative COVID test or proof of vaccination. That's a key part to reopening our borders. The second thing is right now, U.S. travel is working closely with the Biden administration and Secretary Raimondo to open air bridges. And the first focus is really the U.K., so that there would be an air corridor between LA and the UK and between the US and the UK where there would be no need for quarantine. And following up on that at this year's G7 summit, President Biden is being asked by Secretary Raimondo to ask all of the members of the G7 event to also commit to opening air corridors with the United States. So since LA is clearly one of the major gateways for international visitation, that's what's gonna help us recover along with having our international offices intact. The other thing I think we can't forget is that we were coming off of nine straight years of record growth before the pandemic. Nine straight years, and it was without virtually everything you see here, right? We are gonna have a more compelling LA experience than we've ever had before. You look at things like certainly in 2018, we welcomed Bank of California Stadium, but you know, last year, SoFi Stadium in Hollywood Park, it's really, the preeminent sporting and entertainment venue in the world right now, absolutely state of the art. But this September, we're gonna welcome the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Um, beyond that, the pandemic has been a huge accelerant to capital improvements. So if you look at the $14 billion modernization at LAX, a great example is the West Gates at Tom Bradley. You've probably heard this referred to as the midfield satellite concourse. If prior to the pandemic, you flew in internationally, strong likelihood was you had to park it on the tarmac and get bussed in. So this is a new concourse that's part of Tom Bradley that has 12 to 15 flexible gates depending on the size of aircraft. And it was completed months ahead of schedule. It's already been turned over to LAX. Justin Urbachi and his team at LAX have done a phenomenal job and the West Gates at Tom Bradley are open for business this month beyond things like Destination Crenshaw, the Lucas Museum. And right now there are 24 hotels in the pipeline in 2021. So we're gonna have unparalleled infrastructure compared to a lot of other destinations. Beyond that, I'm sure you all know this, but when you see it all one place, it's really pretty remarkable. So part of this is what are we gonna be able to do to drive demand to our hotel community? Every single year for the balance of the decade virtually, we have a major sports or industry event. So what a lot of people may not know, this year we're gonna be hosting MLS's All-Star Game at Bank of California Stadium. But starting in February of next year, buckle your seatbelts because we've got the Super Bowl in February. We've also got Major League Baseball's All-Star Game, which we rebooked. The College Football Playoff National Championships are gonna be here in 23, along with the US Open for the PGA at LA Country Club. In 24, we've got the Men's West Regionals for the NCAA. In 24, we're also hosting this little industry event you might have heard of called IPW. Um, you know, I think it's impossible to overstate what bringing IPW to LA is going to do to really shine a global spotlight on LA. 
And then we are one of the candidates to be a host city for the FIFA World Cup and then certainly the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, I cannot think of one destination in the world that has this lineup of major events. So then how are we promoting all of this? And this is really the last part of today's presentation is, you know, Don Skio is our chief marketing officer and he and his team have consistently, I think, led the industry in terms of really compelling creative. So our goal was, number one, we wanted ownable creative messaging. You know, we don't want to be kind of in there with the crowd. We wanted messaging that would cut through and would be uniquely LA and authentically LA so no one else could replicate it. The second thing is, one of the things we know from research is around the world, when people come to LA, it's because they want to experience the diversity of people and places that have made us such a rich community. People want to come here because we are such a diverse and inclusive place. So we wanted that to come through clearly in our creative. And the other thing is, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen advertising, which candidly is a little bit you know, depressing. Some advertising is still looking backwards. Well, I'm a big believer that rear view mirrors on a car are smaller than windshields because what's behind us matters a hell of a lot less than what's in front of us. People want to be optimistic. They want to be inspired. They want to be reinvigorated. And that's what research shows people believe a trip to LA does for them. So this is really important. Again, I give Wendy Keel huge credit for this. And Chelsea Benitez, who's our director of Tourism Insights, we test all of our creative because we want to make sure it's not just for, it's not for us really. It's for all those audiences around the country who are targeting. And we want to make sure the message resonates with them. And most importantly, actually will inspire a trip to LA. I will tell you that the campaign you're about to see is the highest testing campaign we've had over the last decade. It's that strong. You'll also notice a new logo. We were very fortunate. We wanted to develop a new dynamic logo that really reflected our community. So we put it out on our RFP and because we're a nonprofit, we couldn't spend a lot on it. Well, Shepard Ferry, who you all know is you know, one of the most renowned graphic artists of our, of our day, his agency is studio number one. And along with an outstanding other agency, House Industries, they responded and they said, you know what, we wanna collaborate on a new logo for LA, for LA tourism because this is a labor of love. We wanna help support our community. So the new logo that you're gonna see here, and we're in the middle of color testing right now, was developed by two of the preeminent agencies and creative minds in LA. And also in terms of where this is running, our 10 week flight for this campaign is running in all the markets you see here. That represents about 40% of US households and the markets in italics are brand new markets for us. And I'll also tell you, because for a lot of the airlines, they're really relying heavily on their hubs. These new markets are exactly the right ones to be in. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen here and I wanna show you our comeback campaign. Los Angeles is a movie. The lighting is perfect. The soundtrack is just right. Costumes are incredible. The sets are amazing. Everyone's here, ready for the next scene. LA is a movie. It's a musical. It's a musical. <laughs> it's a comedy. It's a romance. It's a sci-fi movie. It's an action movie. It's a comeback story. It's a comeback story. Comeback story. It's a comeback, it's a comeback story. story. It's a comeback story. It's a comeback story. Un regreso. It's a comeback story. Nah, hold up. It's your comeback story. So I'm sure you'll agree, I mean, again, giving huge credit to Don Skio and particularly Bill Cars, who is our head of digital and brand marketing, Jamie Simpson, who heads up global communications, and Shelley Leopold, who's our editorial director. They were all instrumental in that campaign. I think they've done a remarkable job of capturing the essence of what is LA. And you should know, by the way, everyone in that ad, they're not just, quote, talent. These are Angelinos who believe passionately in our community and want to see our tourism industry come back strong. So what does it mean? Well, this is really exciting news to share. So 
the city recently announced that they have created a tourism master plan. This was developed actually a couple of years ago by Don Liu and the team over at Convention and Tourism Development. And you know, remember, we were talking actually about over tourism back then. I guess we'll refer to that as the good old days. So they announced the tourism master plan really to focus on the long term infrastructure that's going to be necessary to have a sustainable tourism economy. Things like mobility, things like addressing issues with homelessness, sanitation, et cetera. And as a result, Joan is going to be convening a tourism cabinet in the city that includes a working group of all the key general managers. So, you know, Streets LA, Public Works, Safety, all those general managers are going to be meeting to make sure that we can do what we need to to give guests a positive experience. But the really exciting news, and this is unprecedented, remember I talked earlier about the Tourism Marketing District. The TMD has been absolutely critical to LA's recovery. Javier Cano and Patty McJennett worked tirelessly about five years ago, and with the city, the city agreed to let the TMD start setting aside reserve funding. And one of the categories for reserve funding was catastrophic events. As a result, the Tourism Marketing District, that's our hotel community, has already contributed $5 million for all of our recovery programming to date. Think about that for a second. Our local hotel community has funded 100% of our recovery programming. There are maybe six markets in the US who've been able to do that. To match that, the mayor in the city's budget has also committed $5 million. And with that combination from the mayor's office and from the tourism marketing district, it's gonna enable us to have our first ever national advertising campaign. And we're gonna launch that in the fall because we're looking at a very strong summer, but the fall is gonna be a shoulder period. So we are gonna be in market capturing 100% of our key target with a national campaign exactly when the hotel community needs it the most. Um, the other thing you should know is what that's going to do. So Tourism Economics said that if we didn't have a national campaign, just status quo, we'd be looking at about 63% occupancy in 21-22. The thing I mentioned earlier, our supply has materially recovered unlike other destinations. So with just a 10% increase in visitation, if we can go from 63 to 69% occupancy, this is what it's going to yield. You're talking about 1.7 billion in incremental spending to our hotel community, about 125 million in revenue, and for the city, 16 million in additional general fund receipts. So, you know, we are so proud to be able to partner with all of you because there is every reason to believe that 2021 and 2022 are going to be the years of LA's comeback. Um, so that's really what we wanted to share today. And, you know, we'd love to open it up if there are any questions from any of today's attendees. Adam, thank you so much. We do have a few questions for you. Um, Trevor Little asks, I think it's a great question. Could you define for us in lay terms what adjusted occupancy from the earlier slides that you shared with us? Yeah, of course. So 19 to 20. So if you think about um, adjusted occupancy, all we're doing is there are a lot of markets that unfortunately their inventory hasn't come back. So let's say in LA, we have 106,000 rooms. Well, let's say you're a market that normally your inventory would be 75,000 rooms, but you only have 60,000 available for sale right now. Well, with only 60,000 rooms versus 75, you can say your occupancy is higher because you're selling fewer rooms. So to make it an apples to apples comparison, we assume that every market had their full hotel supply back, much like LA. So that's what really gives you an apples to apples comparison. Otherwise, the occupancy numbers in those markets where their inventory hasn't recovered are really inflated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's another um, subject that you brought up earlier, and that's the reconvene of meetings. And for us to reconvene at optimum levels, we would have to show our vaccination or a negative COVID testing. This has been a, a subject of conversation among a lot of us before even today. Where does that responsibility lie? Does it lie with the meeting planner? Does it lie with the hotel or the venue center? Is there any best practice to employ in making sure that we are respectful of the meeting planner and welcoming to the attendee? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the, so I'll give you a, 
a two-part answer. The first part is I can't go into detail yet because the ink's not dry on the contract, but much like share care for the hotel community, we've also been working on another LA first, which will enable us to offer um, a health pass. And I can't mention the organization we're okay. working with, but when you all see the announcement, it will make perfect sense. Um, we're partnering now on the group side to offer discounted pricing because if you really want to be able to show verified proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test, there's a very reputable third party that has come up with a terrific platform for this. And it's paid by the event organizer and it's done on a per head basis. Um, not only have we been able to negotiate that for our four citywides that are still on the books for the fourth quarter of this year, we'll be able to offer this at no cost to them. We've also negotiated deeply discounted pricing so that every other event organizer who wants to take advantage of this will be able to do so at a significantly lower cost than anyone else. And that will be another first and exclusive for LA. But the answer to your question more broadly is it's a shared responsibility. You know, in terms of what county health is looking at, they're looking at every side of it. They wanna make sure the host venue is abiding by all the protocols. That's where ShareCare Verified comes in. They also want to know that the event organizer and the attendees are abiding by the protocols. And that's where this new turnkey solution will come into play. But I think the, the key there, and I think you articulated it perfectly, Libby, is how can you do it so it's seamless, right? It's very easy to have a safe meeting that's absolutely miserable. That's not what we want to be in LA. And because honestly, one of the benefits of coming last out of the gate We've seen a lot of events across the country. Some have worked well, some not so much. So I think LA is going to be able to offer delegates an experience that's not just safe, but still gives them all the positive things from LA that they want to see. So you just led into a great uh, sequential question, and that's the share care. Mm -hmm. Will the cost for that, for the hotels, is that charged a flat fee, or will that be based on hotel inventory, how many rooms I have in the hotel? Or do you know how the fees are, are formulated? Yeah, we've actually negotiated reduced pricing on that. And um, Heather's going to be doing outreach to the hotel community. It's based on, um, you know, how much you pay per room per night. And that's a monthly charge. So normally, share care is a dollar per room per night. So if you have, you know, 500, not per night, excuse me. So if in a month, if you have 500 rooms, you're going to pay 500 bucks. So it's a dollar per room per month, not per night. A okay. dollar per room per month. So if you're a 500 room hotel, it would be $500. We've actually negotiated reduced pricing of I believe 85 cents per room per month. So particularly for smaller properties, you're talking about 200, $250 a month. It's not prohibitively expensive. And we've negotiated that discounted pricing exclusively for the term of our contract. So the hotel is gonna be able to take advantage of that. And now that we've launched, Paula is gonna be introducing that discounted pricing to the local hotel community. I, I think that's extremely important because, and I know you're sensitive to this, how the conversation will go with the owner is, how does that benefit me? Yep. And sometimes those type of, in, that's what it is, it's an investment in order to substantiate and stabilize your, your operation. So the more information that we can gain on that, the better. Got, yeah. I've got about two more questions and I thank everybody for hanging on. It's just been an incredible program. Um, we would like to know if you're able to convey to us what the tourism department is doing to continue, very sensitive subject, to address the homeless and safety issues of downtown LA and really yeah. the, the overarching of LA. We wanna be, every life matters. Every life matters, including those of the homeless and those in transition. And the more information that we have to work with, the better we can support it. 100%. Heather, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I can jump in here a little bit and say that, um, you know, I think there was a lot of lessons learned during the pandemic. Um, we were more, we, we moved faster as, as a collective community, moved faster to get people off the street than any other point in history. I think um, at, the, pro at the, the total duration of the project overall, at some point we had about 15,000 um, individuals circulated through Project Room Key. Um, you know, the, the city governments, the state, everybody realized that 
hotels are an opportunity to provide that transitional housing into uh, permanent supportive housing. housing. Um, this was also a lifeline during the pandemic for some hotels um, that received revenue from Project Roomkey and were able to, to do their part in helping out the community during COVID. So I think it was an extremely rewarding um, experience for everyone who was able to participate. And there was a lot of success in getting folks housed and into that permanent supportive housing afterwards. Um, it, it was a very difficult process initially. Um, the contracting with a government agency at that speed um, was not as fast as everyone would have hoped, um, but eventually everybody started working together. We worked out the kinks um, and rooms became available and we got folks in, but it really came to those uh, permanent, um, I should say the, the third party services. So meals, drug counseling, um, security, safety, all of those, those components that go into those shelter programs um, had to be in place in order for that program to actually get off the ground. Um, but we're seeing quite a few of those hotels, uh, their contracts are ending, so they're going to be uh, returned back to market for um, hotel and uh, leisure use. So it, it's been an interesting program, but you know, I'll say that it's such a multifaceted conversation and, and hotels and motels um, eventually transitioning into to permanent uh, solutions under home key um, are, are gonna continue to be a government um, option. Um, they're going to invest uh, state and county and city to purchase hotels. I'm sorry, my uh, landscaper is here, but that's loud. But, um, you know, I think the future of, of project Home key is, is going to be a good one for the industry. We have stepped up and done a lot, and um, it's turning into something that can be a bit of a legacy for us. Um, you know, we're hospitality. We take care of people. That's what we did during the pandemic. Um, but the effects on tourism, um, you know, I think is a, is a broader conversation. Do people feel safe staying in our communities? Um, absolutely. We have a, a fabulous city. Um, everyone who travels here from outside of the country has their own um, perspectives of safety, but um, this is one of the safest communities I've ever um, felt. And, and I think there's a lot of camaraderie coming out of COVID that people are here for one another. So I, I have faith that um, we'll overcome these challenges and, and find the right path together. And if I can pick up on that, Heather, um, totally agree with everything you just said. I think Libby, the key here is how we frame this. Because if we talk about solving homelessness, now you're talking about a massive, you know, multi-year, maybe decade-long effort, right? Yeah. We can't solve homelessness in the next six months. That's going to require the continued, not just investment of funding from H and Triple H, and collaboration in both the public and private sector. But I think what we really need to focus on is three key things and that's safety, sanitation, and accessibility. Because if I think you talk about homelessness, it's, it's boiling the ocean, right? It's such an existential issue for us to deal with. For all of you and for our local hotel community, and you know, unfortunately during the pandemic, we have seen the encampments broaden and you know, there are issues in communities like downtown LA and Hollywood and Venice. So what we've really been working, and again, Patty has been instrumental in this effort, We've been working with Doan and the team at, at the city's tourism department, as well as with city council to say, here are three things we can and need to do now. Because I think we're very confident in our ability to drive demand. But when people come here, we want them to have a positive experience. So what we're asking for is from a health and safety standpoint that they really do you know, as much as they can to make our streets and public spaces accessible to do what they can to clean up the encampments, and more importantly, to create a very safe environment in those areas that are really populated by visitors. And that's really gaining traction. We're hearing that now from more and more members of city council. The best example I can give you is we actually, um, Patty and I had to appear before the Committee on Trade, Travel and Tourism recently to speak on the city's $5 million investment in our recovery campaign. And Don Lu was also in that call, and I believe it was Council Member Kikorian who said, what do you believe is the single greatest threat to tourism's recovery right now? And Don said, honestly, it is health and safety, sanitation, and accessibility. 
you know, it's not homelessness, that's a bigger issue. But when you've got everyone now locking arms, we are hearing more and more public officials say, if we want tourism to come back strong, we've got to address these issues. I guarantee you, Patty and Heather are on the front lines of that every single day. But I think that's a more digestible way of attacking it. And one final question, this is for me, but it would benefit everyone. Do you think both of your respective websites are the best resource for us to keep updated on what the city is doing and what we have planned for the future? Because those were some very powerful slides about our future and we just, we're all invested and we want to make sure that we support that. Yeah, definitely do check out the Hotel Association website. Um, we've really curated resources for employers, employees, um, the latest protocols, um, all in one place on our coronavirus page. So do check it out. There's okay. uh, an abundance of information. Yeah, Thank and the you. same for, same for discoverlosangeles.com. Um, one of the things we've done is we found that there's been huge web traffic from visitors who want to know, number one, what's open, and when they come, what can they expect? I think one of the biggest things that we all need to let our customers know is you need to plan ahead now because since there's limited capacity, what we don't want, want is someone to come here and realize there weren't enough tickets at that venue for that day. So I think the main thing we're trying to do on the website is let people know what's open and what they can expect so they can plan accordingly and have a great experience once they're here. Thank you. Well, we went about nine minutes over, but nine very valuable minutes. So I thank you so much. We'll stay in touch with the websites. And I think June 15th is a telling uh, date for all of us that we're looking forward to. That's only a few weeks away. But um, again, I most sincerely thank you for investing in us by giving us some of your time today. Absolutely our pleasure and anytime the hotel community has really been the backbone of our industry. So anything we can do to support you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. I think Mitch, unless you had something that you wanted to add, this would conclude today's meeting. And thanks to everyone who took time out of their day to invest in their future.